right, welcome back. For me, it's been 30 seconds. For you, maybe it's been two days. I don't know. Uh, but we're looking at measuring tools, and we're going to get into our special tools. We're going to finish this out. Uh, these usually I, I, I take a little bit more time with. Um, not too much time, but a little bit more time because they may be new to you. Um, some of these measuring tools are probably going to be very, very simple because you've used them, but there may be some of you that haven't used a micrometer dial caliper before. And so we'll kind of break the, uh, bring those into the conversation. First up is a micrometer. First thing is it's a precision measurement. So you will see that we're not going to measure anything on an engine with a, a tape measure. And I knew that in the picture there, but that's just to get you thinking. We can't be within a sixteenth of an inch. We need to be way more precise than that. Um, if I said, "Hey, go uh, go put new pistons in," and you know, if you're a sixteenth of an inch off, no big deal. Which to you, that is like sixteenth of an inch, man. If I was doing woodwork and I was only sixteenth of an inch off, that's awesome. Engine, it's gonna blow up. You you can't be that that far off. So, um, micrometers. If you haven't used one of these before, these are the most precise thing that we can measure with. Now, the thing is, though, they are limited in what size they can measure with. I'm not going to go into how to use these, Mr. Batag, or your instructor sometime is going to also go over that. Uh, but today, the big thing I want you to know is that I can only measure one inch at a time. So I can only measure between zero and one. If I have a bigger micrometer, I can measure between one and two. So the spacing is all I can measure between one inch. These are very expensive and very fragile. So we want to make sure that we're using it gently, we're using it the, the proper way, and, and also storing it correctly. So I'm going to put it back in its case. If you haven't used one of these and we get into our next spot, spend some more time um, reading about them and there's a lot of great demos on there. Um, if you need help with them, Mr. Batag, myself, or your instructor can also help. Next up is our dial caliper. Now these are a little bit more, um, these are kind of more of our go-to. One, for most times, they're easier for students to read, but also they can do a lot more and they have a lot longer range. This one goes up to six inches, so I have six inches of measurement. I can still measure to a very fine, precise um, point. That's gonna give me the precision and tolerance I need, but it also has some cool features that maybe some people don't know. So one thing people normally do is they measure like this, they put something in here, and they tighten it down, they get the measurement. So that is your outside jaws. What also has inside jaws? So right here, I can put this in something, and um, let's see here, maybe I wanted to know how big, that pocket was and yeah I could try to line it up like this but easier way to do it would be this here now I'm showing you black uh, let's see if I can get the light just right and I can measure with the jaws like that that's your inside jaws maybe another thing I want to do is I want to know the depth of that pocket and that'd be really hard to do but I can use this depth gauge I can go out like that and I can put that in here I can push down and now I know the depth of that pocket Another thing these can be really good for is you can say, well, maybe I need to know if my piece is set to one inch. Well, I can set this to one inch, tighten this screw up here, and now it's not going to move on me. And I can say if I'm working on the lathe and I need to turn something down to one inch, I can put it there, slide it over. If it, if it doesn't slide over, I keep going. As soon as it just fits right, I know it's at one inch. So it's kind of like a check no-go gauge. One thing I also show with my fabrication class, and this is a, uh, there's definitely a, a lot of opinions on this is using the jaws to scribe or to mark. So say I wanted to mark down a piece of side of an edge of a metal, I know exactly where one inch is, and then I can mark the other way in one inch. And that way I know I have a perfect one inch square. Now some people don't like that because it can tear up the jaws for measurement. Um, I don't measure at the jaws, the tip of the jaws anyways, I always measure up in here. So I don't think it really ma uh, damages it, but I do understand the point that some people don't like that. I'm okay with it here in my class. Uh, you, you'll find different opinions and so be it. We, 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 we'll, we'll do it that way in our class and wherever you work in the future, uh, that might be a question you ask them, hey, can I mark with these? If not, there's other ways to do it. Um, and there's, there's other ways that you can, you can make that happen. So dial caliper, very, very useful. It is still very expensive and they are very fragile. If this falls off the ground on our concrete floors, it's probably broke. Um, even if you dropped it from a few inches onto our steel countertops, it's probably broke. So please be very careful. Do not play around with these. They are very sharp at the jaws on both sides. So please be very careful with them. Next up is our feeler gauges. Now our feeler gauges, these are used for gauging the clearance or spacing where accurate measurement is crucial. We use these a lot for spark plug gap gauges, for setting um, valve clearances, 
uh, for even setting spark plug gaps. Kind of fan that out right there. Now it has a range of sizes to 0 0.001 up to maybe 0 0.032. Actually, there's there's some now that have even more, and there's some that get even more precise than that. Um, that's your pretty standard sizes. It is metric or standard. Feather that out. Um, you'll see some videos in the future of me uh, how to use this, and you'll definitely be using this if you go into Auto Tech one next year. But feeler gauge, um, putting these away properly, I'll kind of do that again here. You can see there's this little recess right here. I push up right there. Now, one thing I can do is when I'm working, say I want to have this size right here out, I can kind of push all of them back and like this. Now I've got just one out and I can use it as I need to. When I'm going to put it back, what I don't do is I don't just go like this and try to slide it in. Push them all out, put them all together, and then back in. They usually use thicker ones on the outsides. That way it doesn't come in here and hit, and then it bends the thinner feeler gauges. So a nice little trick there for putting those away. Um, next one, ruler. Straight edge steel rule, metric or standard, used to measure linear distances. I don't have a metal one, but I do have a, uh, a, a long level, but it does have a ruler on it, and it's a really nice straight edge. Now, a metal one's really nice because you can set it on a deck, like a block of an engine, and you can see if it's flat. That's what a, a main one is used for, but steel rule can be nice to make a straight line when you're doing any fab work. Having a level is really nice because you can know if something's level or not, if it's a little bit off. Longer the level, the more accurate you can be for long spans, um, but you can also find them little small ones uh, for smaller applications. But steel rule, nice thing there. We'll talk more about those when we get into some specific labs. All right, telescoping gauges. I talk about a tool I should have grabbed because this is probably one of the few measurement tools you haven't seen before. Used to measure linear distances on an inside. Now these are more precise than inside um, the inside jaws of a micrometer because it's literally snapping to that distance and then you tighten it down. Um, very hard to demonstrate without showing you, um, but telescoping gauges, um, really, really good for measuring the inside bore uh, on our pistons. One of the measurement labs we, excuse me, commonly do is we put that down in there, we measure three spots down into the piston and then we turn it 90 degrees and we measure up. And that gives us all kinds of cool information, um, looking at the stroke, looking at outer, out around, a taper, all kinds of stuff. Um, we'll talk more about that one, and we'll definitely be using it if you move on to the higher level classes. All right, specialty tools. This is it. We're almost done. We're getting there. I'm getting winded. Need a drink. A little, little water, H2O. My fridge is right there. It's so close, but I'll get through this. We'll finish it up. All right, hex wrench, also called an Allen wrench. Comes in... Uh, bunch of different ways. It says, it says L and T handle shapes, which is very common that it's L or T. Also come as sockets. So you can put it on there and you can run it in a socket. Uh, they have six sides. That's why it's called a hexagonal. And I know it's getting hard to see on here, but that is there. Um, but it's a different type of, of, of fastener. So we have um, hex and, and um, Allen wrenches. They're, they can be used for basically a um, a six-sided interior bolt. Now, most of the bolts you've seen are six-sided, but it's the exterior what you're going on. These, you're actually putting into the interior, and so it's a different style. So it's basically just a, a flip. It's the, it's the inverse of, of a socket. Um, available in tons of sizes, different applications, different lengths, different materials, all kinds of stuff. Um, big thing is, is you got to make sure that you're using a standard when it's standard or metric um, when it's metric, because Standard metric are so close in so many different points that it's very easy to, to strip something out. I'm looking at my, my camera here for the first time in a while. I see it's getting starting to get a little dark, starting to get a little more shade in here. So I apologize for the lighting as it's getting worse. All the more reason to, to hurry up, Mr. Locker. All right, next up is your flywheel holder. And out of context, this is probably doesn't make any sense, but this is designed to hold the fins on the flywheel. So your flywheel, um, your starter clutch socket, and this are going to go in conjunction, um, and this is to take off the flywheel and the starter clutch. Starter clutch is the most amount of torque on any bolt in your engine, and there's no good way to get to it. Uh, there's no way to hold on to it. There's no, you know, giant um, sides to it, no allens or anything. So you have to hold on to the flywheel, and you have to break it loose. If you remember watching the parts video, 
Actually, you can see me doing that in that quick little time lapse at the beginning of the video. I will show you more uh, about that either this semester or, or next semester, whenever we get a chance to do some more of that kind of stuff. So the thing it's in conjunction with is the starter clutch socket. This is your starter clutch socket. So that actually goes onto your starter clutch and I'm in a weird position and it twists that loose and that's what's gonna break it free. They also have a starter clutch wrench, um, not as common, but still very useful. The reason it's not as common is because you can see that's not a ton of length. I mean, yeah, it's kind of long, but I can put a big old breaker bar on this guy right here and I can break that loose a lot easier than with that, that wrench. So as you can see in there, that is a very unique special tool for your small gas engine. Really the only thing you're gonna find that for is a small gas engine. Next is your piston ring compressor used to aid in installation of the piston. Now your piston, when you popped out, if you had took comp design and you did the small gas engine, I know a lot of you didn't, um, but if you did, you probably remember that your piston just went right in. Well, it had no rings on it. So your piston rings, as they get compressed or as they kind of spring out, remember they're, they're meant to kind of spring out and hold against the wall of the cylinder. So as it goes up and down, it's holding on to that, that wall, that cylinder. Well, that makes it very hard to install them. So what you have here is you have your piston ring compressor. It has a four-sided piston ring compressor wrench, not an Allen. I usually put that on a, on a test. Not an Allen, the way I can tell it has four sides. But it looks just like one. You, you would think they would just do an Allen here. It would make a lot more sense. You don't have to have two tools. But they didn't. So they've used a piston ring compressor key. And that tightens around the piston. And when I have it the size I need, I can then push this in with the end of a rubber mallet and I can push that piston through into the block. And the rings are now squeezed together and they push in and then they snap out once they go in. So ratchets around the locks and bands as close to the piston as possible. What's very common to do with these is when you tighten them down is to make sure that they are level. Now it's kind of hard to see, but see that little lip right there? If I were to do that, that means that this isn't level. So you would come around here and you would tap the top edge to make that level again. And that way you know it's flat before you push it in. We will do this at some point. You will definitely do it next year if you take the class. All right, valve spring compressor tool. My favorite tool, most students' least favorite tool. One thing I always say with this is a tool is, is just that. It's a tool. It's not a, hey, this is guaranteed to work. People think that, oh, I have this in here. Why can't the valve come out as soon as I want it to? Well, because it's just to aid you in removing and installing the springs. You still have to know how to use the tool. You still have to know how to use it properly. And just like with anything, it may not work perfectly. You may have to take a couple different little stabs at it to get it in there and get it adjusted. Now, there is adjustment for these jaws right here. So these jaws can expand out, they can come together. And there are these screws right here that unfortunately, whatever the design they've done for years and years and years, strip out all the time. Um, I always say, if you can get it set, don't mess with it. So if it works, don't try to change it. This right here tightens it up and you're compressing that spring to remove it. Now you may have saw in the little parts video I did, the time-lapse where I pulled these out. Uh, this is definitely a finesse thing. This is definitely the thing that kids struggle with the most. That's why I have you guys practice it a whole bunch. So you'll get lots and lots of practice with it. So on a big engine, these look a lot bigger and a lot different. Small gas engines, these are just this design. All right, next up. Torque wrench. Torque wrench is probably one of your more expensive tools you're gonna buy because it's a very precise tool and it's gotta do something in a very specific way, which is let you know how much torque you have. Now there's three styles, a beam, dial, and click. From the top, you have a beam, which is basically as you turn it, a little needle on it deflects and it tells you how much torque it is. I don't like those because you gotta be looking at it and then you're kind of concentrating on too many things. The next is a dial, which is basically just a slightly better version of a beam. You're still looking at something, but you can set it to like a little red, the, the black casing on that one turns. There's a little red indicator so you can see where the needle is. You don't have to be so precise and staring at it. The last one is my favorite, and this is a click, which now they actually have electronic ones that you can set it in here. That's the kind I have, set it in here, and then say, okay, I'm ready. I wanna tighten it to 50 foot pounds. You start tightening it, and it literally vibrates and blinks at you. This one, the, the mechanical version of that is it clicks. So I'm gonna, I can set it, 
That's not the clicking you're going to hear. And I can go here and as I tighten it down, which I'm not going to be able to tighten it down with just my hand, if I tighten this down, it'll literally, that's the noise. That's the click you want to hear. And that lets you know that you stopped. Now the thing is, after you hear that click, you can still keep turning. So you have to be paying attention while you're using this. If you like have music blaring or you have headphones in, you're not going to hear that click. You might feel it, but if you have gloves on and you know work on something else, maybe kind of hard to do. So your torque wrench is very important because everything on an engine is set to a specific torque spec, meaning that it needs to be 20 foot pounds, 50 foot pounds, 110 foot pounds. Might be in Newton meters, which is just the metric version. Maybe in inch pounds. Whatever the unit is, make sure you're using a torque wrench that's in the same measurement. Don't try to be like, okay, well, it's in inch pounds, but I know that if I multiply it, I, I might, no. Just get the right one, the right measurement, and use it appropriately. With these, they come in varying lengths. They come in different drive sizes. Um, there's a lot of money in your torque wrenches. They are calibrated. So say after time, after a year or so, this gets out of calibration where, man, 50 foot pounds is, feels a lot harder than it used to. Well, you may not be getting weaker. It may be that this is out of calibration. A lot of these can be recalibrated by, um, you know, whoever your service provider for your tools is. Maybe it's Mac or Snap-on or Matco. Uh, even Craftsman, you can send these in. They can recalibrate it for 20 bucks. And now you have basically a brand new torque wrench again. <clears throat> and so as you're going through, Got some different options on there, but a very precise tool. Um, we'll use this a lot. Basically, everything in automotive, there's no like, eh. Now, there are some things, some covers and some bolts, but almost everything is really designed with a torque spec to it. Um, so, And we're going to stick to that. All right, next up is our spark plug gap gauge. Um, the two most common styles are the ones on the bottom. You probably have seen this one here. It's kind of covered up my picture at probably every hardware store. In fact, this is an AutoZone one right here. Um, they're like a dollar. Uh, they can go in your keychain. You can show people how cool you are because you're constantly changing your spark plugs. I always find that as a funny joke because literally most people have never changed a spark plug. And people that do it commonly are probably bragging about that on their keychain. Um, yeah, old school, something you change a lot more, you know, making the plug with a smaller gap or a larger gap, depending on your application. Drag racers did it a lot for ways to increase performance. Now, I, I can't think of people that do it. For, for vehicles, they're like, oh, it works, good. Um, but there is still a need to set that uh, agricultural, you know, your tillers, your lawnmowers, um, that kind of stuff. Um, they're a little bit, a little bit more testy to different spark plug ranges because they're not as precise of an engine, um, which kind of makes, kind of sounds backwards. You figure a more precise engine would be uh, needing a more specific plug, but gaps and plugs don't really change anymore because your engine is so precise. It doesn't vibrate as much. It doesn't, things don't change and wear out. Um, this one is, so I guess I'll go back to this one. So you put your plug in here and you slide it until it stops and that tells you your size. Um, I don't like this one because you can't really expand your plug if it's not big enough. You can force it up there if you, if you can, but I think an easier way is these ones right here, which basically is broken down into a whole bunch of common sizes. And then you have a spreader on the backside. So you can put this in between the plug and literally spread the plug. Now, if you need to push a plug back together, all you need to do is put that on a steel table and push down. Um, simple enough to do. Don't want to smash it together and you don't want to open it and close it enough because it will crack that little electro that's sticking out. But you want to make sure that you have a, you, you can, can get still in there, but you close it up enough that it's not, you know, this giant gap. Definitely something that's easier to do when you actually have a plug in front of you and you're actually working through it. Harder to kind of explain or visualize without those things. So hopefully we'll be doing that um, next year in Auto Tech One. Uh, what well, we will, but hopefully I'll see you there. All right. <clears throat> Compression gauge. This is a diagnostic tool. This is kind of like your stethoscope. This is like, hey, what's going on inside that engine without actually taking it apart? They're not going to open you up to check your lungs, see if you're breathing or how well you're breathing. They're going to put that stethoscope on there. They're going to hear, they're going to see some stuff. So this is going to go into that spark plug hole that we were just kind of spreading that gap for. And you're going to crank the engine over, you know, if you got electric start, crank it over, pull start. And you're going to build up compression and you're going to see what your compression gauge actually says. So you're going to go through and crank the engine over, tell me what size, how much compression you have. And that lets us know a lot of things. 
lets us know that the rings are seated well, the rings maybe are worn, maybe things blowing by, maybe you've got a cracked ring. Then the other thing we can do is we can then set and wait to see if the pressure goes down. Now some of these have a little check valve which only just keeps going up and it never goes back down. Some will go up and then you leave it on compression at the top of compression and then you let it come down to see if you have any leak down or a leak down cylinder test. Now this one isn't specifically designed for a leak down test, um, but we do have some that are. Chain wrench. Um, chain wrench is, is a unique tool because it allows you to um, go around various sizes and lengths. It's something we're not going to commonly use, but it is something that we have had to use on a flywheel or two in the past, but we just couldn't hold with a, with a flywheel holder anymore. So we actually wrap that around. The best part is it really kind of it, it makes itself to whatever shape you need. So, you know, if you need a shape that's like that, you need a shape that's like that, it will grab all those things and then it pries against itself. And then that's how you can loosen something. Typically used by pipe fitters because you can fit around pipes, um, can fit around big pipes that, you, you know, you really just don't have any other wrenches for. So chain wrench is really nice for that. Last but not least is a bench vise. And why do I include this in here? Well, because we have a whole bunch of them in the shop. And for our small gas engines, a lot of students at some point may need to use one of these. Um, they're used to hold work pieces to free up your hands. So you may need to put something there and then to turn it. You know, a lot of times when we're, you know, in class, you have a partner or an instructor or someone to help you. But when you're in the real world, you probably don't have that person you can say, hey, come over here real quick and help me. Yeah, you probably have some other people around you, but they're also working. They're also doing their job and they don't want to stop to help you. And the main reason I put it on here, this is not to crush things. I don't know how many times I've walked around and I've seen someone smashing a pencil or putting their hand in there, tighten it up. I can handle it. Don't. All right. If I see that, that's, um, that's going to be something that's going to get written up and don't abuse stuff. You know, you've got a, a privilege of working this nice shop. Um, use it. Um, enjoy what you're learning. But don't abuse those privileges. So bench vice, not use to crush stuff all around the shop. Um, gives you a chance to free up your hands, but that is it. You made it to the end of this very long video. This is the longest lecture I do all year. And unfortunately you had to do it during e-learning. Um, and that's okay. So, uh, broken them two parts, take each piece at a time. You got to pause it. I know I talk fast, um, on YouTube, you can literally slow the video down and maybe you need to slow it down a little bit. So I make more sense. Or if you're really good, you can speed it up and I can talk like a squirrel or a chipmunk or whatever animal. That doesn't sound like that, uh, but we're done. A lot of stuff to go through. Make sure you're filling out your notes, submit your notes to your instructor, and I'll see you guys next time.